my name is In Tae Jung. I'm a postdoc at NAS Goddard. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the Lyman alpha equivalent with distribution and ionized structures into the epoch of reionization at redshifts above seven. Uh, this talk is based on my recent paper, which is extended from my PhD study with Steve Finkelstein. And it has been submitted to uh, HA a month ago, so it will be available soon on archive. So here I have my collaborators. So this week, we, we had a great discussion about the Lyman alpha emission as well as reionization. So that's because Lyman alpha visibility is one of the most promising probe of reionization. So such as the measuring the Lyman alpha fraction or looking at the Lyman alpha luminous function. So along with those studies, uh, here we implement a more detailed analysis of Lyman alpha on constraining the equivalent width distribution. The motivation of studying the equivalent width distribution is that it uses more information from spectroscopic observations than the others. For instance, the Lyman alpha flux, uh, galaxy UV continuum level, in addition to the number of Lyman alpha detections. Uh, the, the equivalent width distribution has been studied at various redshift ranges uh, and it's well described with an exponentially decaying function of form, uh, which is shown in the left to plot, and that are characterized by its defaulting scale W0. The rather shifted dependency of the uh, equivalent width distribution, so its defaulting scale is shown in the right plot from Santos et al. 2020, uh, which displays the compilation of the distribution measurements at redshift from zero to six. At redshifts uh, below six, where reionization has been completed, the folding scale does not change very much over time. However, the into the epoch of reionization, an increasing amount of neutral hydrogen in intergalactic medium would have an impact on the Lyman of visibility. So here we aim to constrain the equivalent with distribution at reionization epoch in order to trace the evolution of IgM neutral fraction. So searching for Lyman alpha emission at around the end of ionization, uh, we performed the deep spectroscopic follow observations for nearly 200 high redshift candidate galaxies with CAC Deimos and MOS fire. Uh, this plot shows the entire survey program in the Goose field. Uh, and uh, today I'm presenting the results from the entire MOS fire observations in the Goose South, uh, Goose North, as shown in the yellow rectangles. And the rest of the survey has been published in in the other publications. So these most fire observations targeted around 70 redshift to seven candidate galaxies with six, six different mask designs for 10 nights of observations in total. See, although our uh, most fire observations provide the deepest uh, near infrared data set for Lyman alpha at this redshifts, it's yet very challenging to detect emission lines from these faint and distant sources. So in order to help detecting faint emission lines from uh, those noise spectra, we applied an improve, improved manner of automated emission line search on our registered spectra after the detailed data reduction correcting the non slate drift issue of MOS fire, uh, we specifically uh, performed an automatic scanning on both 1D and 2D spectra. Our automatic scanning has been done with source extractor runs on 2D spectra and 1D Gaussian fitting search on 1D spectra. So in short, this automatic scanning uh, detected several uh, emission lines missed, by, missed from visual inspection, which supplements that uh, visual inspection and guarantees the machine-driven consistency on detecting the faint emission lines. So we also checked all low redshift possibility and finalized the list of Lyman alpha emitters. So finally, uh, we detect Lyman alpha emission lines from uh, 15 galaxies in total from 70 galaxies. And uh, 10 of them are detected at four sigma level displayed in the left and listed in the top rows in the uh, table uh, in order of uh, their spectroscopic redshifts. So we perform asymmetric Gaussian fitting on registered one d spectra to estimate the physical properties of the detected Lyman alpha emission lines uh, that are listed in the table, including emission line fluxes and equivalent width and the line asymmetry. So these are the great number of spectroscopic confirmations ever at this redshifts. 
And be before I move on the estimating equivalent redistribution, I am giving a, a quick summary of our findings from the Lyman alpha emission properties. So we detect 10 emission lines, uh, 10 Lyman alpha emission lines at redshift above seven, including one at uh, redshift 7.94 at the highest redshifts among these. And we find six Lyman alpha emitters uh, with equivalent width larger than 50 Armstrong, including one extremely large equivalent of, uh, with Lyman alpha emitters of 280 Armstrong. So this proves that uh, these large equivalent with Lyman alpha emitters are not very rare in this early universe. And also we couldn't find any agent signatures from our observation. So that this may require very young and meta poor population stars to explain its extremely large equivalent width. Uh, we also estimate the asymmetry of the line profile, which reveals the most of these Lyman alpha shows asymmetric shapes. And also with the largest number of spectroscopic confirmations at redshifts above seven, we tested the accuracy of the photometric redshifts, measuring the, the relative errors in, in, in the right bottom pattern. So our result shows the overall quality of our photometric redshifts measured from Finkenstein et al. 2015, obtained from HSD and speech IROC data appears really good. Uh, with these successful detections of Lyman alpha emissions, do we measure the equivalent with distribution of Lyman alpha at this redshift? So here we applied our methodology from uh, Zhang et al. 2018 for constraining the distribution uh, by assessing the likelihood of detecting Lyman alpha emission lines from simulated mock emission lines. Uh, this is because uh, this methodology utilizes both detections and non-detections, putting uh, more constraint on the equivalent with distribution. And this method considers all data incompleteness that are affecting the Lyman alpha visibility in our observations, such as photometric redshifts and galaxy continuum level and observational detection limits. So I'm skipping the details of the method, but in short, <clears throat> we basically obtain the probability distribution of the expected number of detections <clears throat> uh, with the folding scale uh, from five to 200 Armstrong as shown in this plot. Um, and we fit these simulated template to our actually detected Lyman alpha em emissions to find the best fit value of e folding scale of the distribution shown in the right panel. So uh, the, our best fit value of e folding scale at these redshifts uh, is 32 Armstrong uh, at the bottom compared to those values at lower redshifts. Uh, our measurement at redshifts is 7.6 shows a reduced defaulting scale, uh, which implies an increasing H1 fraction in the IGM. So with the measured equivalent with distribution, here we also infer the IGM neutral fraction. So in order to do that, we, we estimate the Lyman alpha uh, transmission in the IGM. So uh, that reflects the optical depth of Lyman alpha in the IS IGM in radiative equation. And that can be empirically derived uh, with some simplified assumptions. So briefly, we consider the intrinsic value as emitted from the galaxy, but not affected by the IGM. Uh, and the observed value reflect the IGM attenuation. So we take the intrinsic equivalent width from redshift below six in the ionized universe, uh, as shown in, in the table. Uh, this assumes no critical evolution of the ISM and CGM properties between these two different redshift uh, ranges, uh, although further studies are absolutely necessary for understanding them. Uh, and we adapt an analytic approach to estimate the uh, H1 fraction as below, uh, which relate Lyman alpha transmission to the uh, average H1 fraction. So our inferred H1 fraction is around the uh, 36% at redshift 7.6, uh, which is considerably lower than the other recent studies reporting the value from 55% up to 88% in at similar redshifts. So we find that this may prove an intrinsic inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous nature of reionization. So relating to such large variation, 
the IgM topology matters here again, uh, reionization, as a reionization is an inhomogeneous process. So in the same context, we study uh, spatial clustering of Lyman alpha emitters shown at the bottom. The left panel presents the number of detected Lyman alpha emitters through the line of sight direction and to the spatial distribution on the right. So the notable feature is the peak near uh, redshift around 7.5 to 6, uh, where we detect more num number of Lyman alpha emitters than expected. The blue dots on the right are the clustered Lyman alpha emitters, which forms two pairs of Lyman alpha emitters. So these results indicate the presence of large, highly ionized structure with a spatial extent of 40 cumulative megaparsec containing these two locally ionized bubbles. So all of these findings provide evidence of inhomogeneity of reionization. And I will stop here and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jintai. Um, so start looking at some questions on Slack. Uh, so we have a question from Christopher. I do not know who's last, the last name, um, who asks, are your equivalent widths rest frame? Uh, yes. So that are all measured in rest frame. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so a question from Ryan Ensley, who asks, he says, very interesting work. Uh, maybe I missed it, but do you find a difference in the E-folding scale at which is greater than seven for bright versus faint galaxies, or at least in their evolution um, from lower redshifts? Oh, so yeah, I, I uh, didn't mention about that, for, but we do see some evolution of the equivalent width uh, depending on the galaxy continuum brightness. So uh, it's interesting to look at the evolution at different UV magnitude ranges. So particularly what we found at, uh, from our observation, we do actually uh, see an increasing, increased value of equivalent width at the brightest galaxy bins. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a question from Takahiro Morishita, who says, uh, nice talk. Is the possibility that the largest equivalent width object is an AGN? What is its absolute magnitude? Oh, yeah, so uh, we want to check it. Uh, if it's AGN, but we do not see any uh, AGN features like uh, nitrogen-5 emission, and all of the, uh, the targeted galaxies are free from the X-ray sources. So uh, it might not be AGN, but yeah. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions here. So sort of merging a question from Rohan Naidu and Brian Lamo. Mm -hmm. um, basically asking whether um, you account for the fact that these sources could be in an overdensity when you calculate the neutral fraction? Uh, so uh, when I calculate the uh, neutral fraction, we include all of these overdensity and, and also we test uh, our value by removing those uh, overdensity reasons. So removing those four clusters of Lyman alpha emitters. So that will imp uh, that would improve the measured neutral hydrogen fraction by around 10 to 15% uh, more. So it's more comparable to the other studies in case we yeah, disregard those overdensity reasons. All right, thanks, Intai. So I think we've got to move on, but um, there's lots more questions on Slack um, for you to have a look at. Okay, thank you. 